We're going to continue our series, Unsung Heroes. This series is looking at less familiar characters in the Bible that exhibit a trait of faith that we want to imitate and that reveal a character trait of God that we can trust. And so I want to ask you this question to have in your mind as we look at our unsung hero today. Have you ever had a problem in your life that you have tried to keep hidden as long as possible? That you were unable to fix yourself and despite resources in your life, you were unable to get it out of your life. Have you ever had a problem like that? Maybe you're living a problem like that right now and no one in this room or your family even knows about it. And you're trying to fix it and you're unable to fix it and you're hoping that the resources you encounter will be able to get it out of your life, but it has not happened yet. If you've experienced something like that, if you are experiencing something like that, then you're gonna love our story today. We're gonna to go to the book of 2 Kings. I'm sure your morning devotional was out of 2 Kings this morning. But if you have no idea where 2 Kings is, let me help you find it. Go to the middle of your Bible, you'll probably hit Psalms, and then just start turning to the front, turn to the left. You'll hit First and Second Chronicles, and then you'll hit First and Second Kings. If you hit First and Second Samuel, you've gone just a bit too far. But First and Second Kings is a book that accounts for how the people of God lived under different leaderships. That when people came to power who are kings of Israel, people either flourished because they were righteous kings, or they suffered because they were unjust kings. And here in 2 Kings, we're kind of coming to the conclusion of where the rebellious heart of God's leadership has turned away from the Lord, has turned the people away from the Lord, and judgment is brewing now. God has sent prophets to the people to, to woo them back, to wake them up, to invite them to return, and they have been reluctant to do so. And so he has sent small judgments that are going to cultivate or culminate in a large exodus in which they will actually be removed from the land for a period of time. And so in 2 Kings, we're going to meet our story by the name of Naaman. Naaman is not an Israelite. He's not a Jew. He'd be considered a Gentile. The Jews kind of divided the world into two groups. The inside group, the us, was the Jews, God's people. And then there was a bunch of thems and theys. They were called the Gentiles. Everyone outside the family of God. Naaman is a they. It says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. So he's a military man was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. So God's using Naaman as an instrument of his justice to a people that are rebellious, that are corrupting justice for those in which they lead. Now, sir, he was, sorry, let's go back to verse, I guess I'm still in verse one. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor. That's the description of this man, Naaman. So he is the general of this military. He's a very successful general. The king of Syria loves him. And he's called a man of valor, a mighty man. I mean, this is a dude's dude. This is like King Kong ain't got nothing on Naaman. Naaman is the strongest, one of the most accomplished people. Everybody wants to be Naaman, except one thing the scriptures tell us, but... But this mighty man of valor was a leper. Leprosy at this time is an incurable skin disease that will take his life. No one has ever been cured from leprosy. In fact, when you get leprosy, it's like a death sentence. Not only will you die from it later, but you're dead to your community. Because they don't want you to spread it. They're going to remove you from your family. They're going to remove you from your place of business and work. And so you're never going to celebrate another birthday with your family. You're never going to be around the dinner table to celebrate holidays with your family. You're not going to go to work on Monday. You have leprosy. You're going to die now to the community. And then over time, your body will die to the grave. And so here's this mighty man named Naaman who has a death sentence, a chink in the armor. So imagine the first time he sees it. I mean, he's there in his armor, he's in his, his 
breastplate and his helmet and he's coming home and he's taking off these pieces of equipment that have preserved his life against sword and arrow and spear. And he's laying it down and he gets to his undergarments, his tunics, and he begins to roll it up to wash his hands. And there, for the first time, he sees this blemish. And he grabs some water and he tries to wash it off his arm. And it's not washing off. And he's thinking, is this leprosy? And so he covers it back up as long as possible. And maybe he goes and seeks out the best medical treatment of the day. Taking oils and ointments and, and rubbing it into this initial spot. And yet, it doesn't go away. It begins to spread. Perhaps he shares this with his wife what's going on eventually gets to the point where he can no longer hide it he's been unable to fix it he's going to have to tell somebody in verse 2 we continue in the story where this says now the syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of israel and she worked in the service of naaman's wife she said to her mistress would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, this is the king of Syria, finally he's going to make it known. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. This is how important this man is. He's not immediately kicked out of the community, put into a leper colony, no, the king of Syria wants to try to save his life and will do anything to save his life. So I'm gonna write a letter. You're gonna to go to the king of Israel and he's gonna send Naaman, not only with a letter, but with great wealth. We continue. So he went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. Modern scholars would say that the accumulation of all of these things would be the sum total of 600 laborers' annual salaries. Like if money can solve his problem, can buy a solution, he's got it. It's going with him. If there's any chance for him to be healed, it looks like he will be healed. Verse 6, and he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, Know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of leprosy. Like no one's ever seen someone been cured of leprosy. No one's ever heard of anyone being cured of leprosy. But you in Israel are now commissioned to cure my servant Naaman from leprosy. How do you think the king responds? Not well. <laughs> Look at verse 7. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes, which is the sign of anguish and sorrow and grief. Like, what, is, what am I going to do? He tears his clothes and said, am I God? Am I God? God has the authority over life. God's the giver and sustainer of life. Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of leprosy? No one can do that. Only God can do that. And he then thinks, only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Like this must be some sort of scheme of war, some tactic that I'm not privy to, that I need to think through. He's, he's probably trying to start a quarrel with me. What's going on? It can't truly be that he thinks I can cure Naaman of leprosy. Well, Elisha the prophet hears what's going on. Verse 8, when Elisha the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Like Elisha's not rattled by this. He says, no, he says, king, I heard you tore your clothes. What are you doing? You're embarrassing us. Just send him over here that he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. And so this whole caravan that is with Naaman departs the palace and seeks out the prophet. And so they arrive at Elisha's house, verse 9. So Naaman 
came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. So imagine this, this is like the presidential motorcade just arrived on your street. Limousine after limousine, lights flashing from all of the law enforcement. Secret service steps out. It's like the power and authority of your country now stands at your doorstep. And Elisha doesn't even get off the couch to go meet him. It's like, send out the gardener. And so he sends out a messenger. Verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry. That upsets Naaman. He becomes angry. Why does he become angry? Well, we'll see. It's, it's injured pride. This is his vanity of who he thinks he is and how he thought this should go down is now assaulted. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought, this is what I think should happen. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. Goes from anger to rage. And, he, and the reason is because his pride has been injured. Like, I'm Naaman. Like when I walk on the streets of Syria, people kneel, people bow, people respect me. They want to be me. And I've shown up in Israel. And this man doesn't even come out to see me. And then he tells me, go wash and be clean. I mean, doesn't he realize I've already done that? If washing could have cured this, I'd already be clean. And then to go wash in the Jordan, that's a dirty river. It's muddy. Like surely if you're going to wash in something, you wash in the rivers back home in Damascus. They're like beautiful spring waters. And so he's so offended that this is the remedy from the prophet's messenger that he leaves in rage. But Naaman has a servant too that helps him come to his senses. Verse 13, but his servant came near, to, near him and said to him, my father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Like what the prophet is actually called to do is a great thing. If you have an NIV translation or King James might translate it, if the prophet has told you to do a great thing, would you not do it? I mean, if the prophet had come out and waved his hands like you wanted him to, like doing some theatrical acts, like spiritual visual aids, would you not have received it? And if he had told you to go do something great, like go to the top of the flat irons and find the flower of healing, we need three petals, but it's guarded by the dragon of death. So slay the dragon and bring me the flower. Would that not have told you, like, yeah, I'm Naaman to the top of the flat iron. But why would Naaman love to do something like that? Because he gets to participate in his remedy. He gets to participate in his own healing. He gets to save his pride. And so the servant's saying, this is actually a great thing for you because this is actually calling you to do something that is really hard for you to do. Is an act of humility to go wash in the Jordan. This is a great act. See, his salvation, his healing will come from surrendering to God's provision of grace not the way he thinks he should be saved. You see that? So Naaman, in humility, must be saved. So he listens to his servant, verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. Now it doesn't say like how this went down. So I, this is just my imagination of it, but I just picture there the motorcade is, the entourage that's been traveling with him, 
Now they detour and they head down to the Jordan. And Naaman gets out and everyone kind of hangs back like, is he actually going to go do this? And Naaman by himself walks up to the edge of the Jordan and thinks, this is so dumb. Everybody's watching. And so he like splashes his toes in it. And his servant's like, all the way under, man. The prophet said all the way under. And so the first time he goes in and he dunks himself and comes up and nothing's changed. He does it a second time and nothing's changed. And a third time and nothing's changed, thinking, what, what am I doing here? So he does it a fourth time and he's ready to give up, but he's like, well, I've already done it four times. I'm more than halfway there. And so five, six happen, and still there's no change. But the prophet called him to do it seven times. Seven's a holy number in the scriptures. It speaks of completeness. It speaks of God and his work. And so he dips a seventh time, and he comes up completely healed, completely healed, to the seventh healed. It doesn't say that the spots went away or that the blemishes were gone. Do you see what it says? And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. This older man experienced real healing, that his skin wasn't just healed of its blemishes, but it was restored to him like child's skin, like an infant's skin, youthful skin. That's the kind of healing that happens from the living God. It's complete healing. And what Naaman now knows is he just had an encounter with the only true living God of the universe. Verse 15, then he returned to the man of God. He stood and all his company, like here's the whole entourage back at Elisha's house. And he came and stood before him and said, behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. He becomes a believer, a worshiper of God. He actually returns back to Syria as a worshiper of the God of Israel. And you say, what a story. I mean, this is spectacular. And if you're going to glean a trait of faith from Naaman, it might be something like this. We receive God's provisions of grace and healing on God's terms, not ours. But Naaman's not the unsung hero of the story that we should pay attention to. Now, the unsung hero is not Naaman. Maybe you missed it like I did for so long. Does Naaman know where to go get healed? Does Naaman know the source of life? Does the king of Syria know where Naaman needs to get healed? Does the king of Israel know where Naaman needs to get healed? Who knows where Naaman gets healed? It's the slave girl. She's the hero. Let's go back to verse two. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. See, the people of valor and might and privilege and authority have no real knowledge of God. But this child does. And because she's willing to share with Naaman the source of healing, Naaman gets healed. Now, just think about this for a second. She was living in Israel when one of the military raids came through from Syria. And she was taken as a slave. And she's in service at Naaman's house. So who's the source of all of her pain and suffering? It's this man. It's Naaman. Who's the reason that she's not going to see her brothers, her sisters, her mom, her dad, who's not going to celebrate another family gathering ever again? 
It's this man. Who's in charge of her life, her well-being right now, for better or worse? It's this man. And so what does she do when she hears the whispers of the house? When Naaman says, I think it's leprosy. It's leprosy. It's a death sentence. It's over for us. I can no longer be the general. We'll be outcasts. We won't be able to live the way we're going to live. Everything you know and our family knows, it's over, and I'm going to die. What does she do when she hears that? Does she think, good, I hope he dies. I hope he suffers like he's caused me to suffer. I hope it's slow. I hope it's painful. Thank you, God, that Naaman has leprosy. No. She knows the source of life and where her enemy be, can be healed. And she speaks up and says, if only Naaman would go to see the prophet, he would be healed. That's the heart of this young servant girl, the slave girl, towards her enemy. I think what she's reflecting and showing is the heart of God towards humanity. This is God's heart towards us. See, when Jesus came, he actually referenced this story. So if you go to Luke chapter 4, Jesus has just come out of a temptation in the wilderness for 40 days. And he comes into his hometown, and he's there at the, at the local gathering in verse 18. He's in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, that's talking about what God's going to do when he sends his Messiah. He picks it up and he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In verse 21, he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's what I have come to do. And what we know is that the Jews are so offended by this. Not you, Jesus. What we think a Messiah should do, what we think a Messiah should be, is not you. We think the Messiah should come and free us from Rome. We think the Messiah should come and liberate us from our political oppressors. Not you, Jesus. And they're offended by him. And so then Jesus tells two Old Testament stories of a prophet being sent, but not to Israel. And one is of Naaman, verse 27, Jesus says, and there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So you're th See, I'm here to say the liberty of captives for all. I'm here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor for all. Not just for you, but for them too. For all who would believe. For anyone who would receive God's provision of grace through me and my work. I'm ready to heal, and to save. See, Jesus has to correct so many of their thinkings of what it means to be the people of God. There's a famous sermon that he gives on a, on a hillside. He sits on the side of a hill, and he just talks about what is the ethic of the kingdom. And one of his famous teachings from Matthew chapter 5 is on how we treat our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, God actually never said that. That's, that's maybe teaching from the religious community. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons or, or daughters, children of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It's just like grace is going out. To everyone who you thinks that you think deserves it, and to those people you think don't deserve it. 
And if you want to be children of your Father in heaven, if you want to be like his offspring, if you want to look just like your daddy does, well, then you can't just love those who love you because everybody does that. But my children reflect my heart when they love their enemies, when they pray for their enemies, when, when they see their enemies hurting, they're willing to share with them the source of life. That's what it means to be the children of God. You see, that's how God treated you. That's how God treated me. Paul writes an incredible letter of theology to a church in Rome. This is Romans chapter 5, when he describes this love that was poured out for you and for me. Chapter 5, verse 6. Paul says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. Like maybe a mother or a father would lay down their life for their children. Maybe a good soldier would give up his life for a great commanding officer. But God, but God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. When did Jesus die for you? When you were strong? When you had it put together? When you were weak, falling apart? When did Jesus die for you? When you were his friend? When you proved your worth? When you and I were his, you see right there? Enemies. That's the heart of God. He sees us in our weak, sinful estate as enemies of God. And he says, I've got to go rescue them. I love them. I want to heal them from their deepest disease. The thing that they're hiding from everyone that they're trying to fix themselves, that they're trying to use the world's resources to get out of their life, and it's not working. I want to heal them from their sin. That's not only killing their life now, that's killing relationships, that's killing communities, but will ultimately destroy their soul. I want to heal them from the only thing that can really threaten them, their sin, which brings eternal death. And he does it for us while we're his enemies. That's the love of God. I think that's what we're seeing in the heart of this slave girl. Is hearing of her enemy sickness. She's willing to share the source of life. See, God's heart has always been for the Jews and the Gentiles. God's people were supposed to be a conduit of his grace, not a container of it. Even the prophets point this out. And, and Paul, at the end of his letter, Romans chapter 15, points out, he, he just sews up all of these words from the Psalms and the prophets, from Samuel, from Isaiah, of this was God's heart was for the world. Chapter 15, verse 8, Paul says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised. It's a title for the Jewish people to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. They would be fulfilled. All the scriptures would be fulfilled of the Messiah. And in order the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. The Naamans, the yous, the me, would glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you amongst the Gentiles and sing to your name, and again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse, a title for the Messiah, for Jesus, will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Who knows where the source of life is? I do. Do you? You might not hold positions of power, of might, of privilege. But each person I believe in this room, if you've been listening today, 
you know where the source of life is, who the living God of the universe is. And the question I want to ask from our unsung hero is, are you willing to share it even with your enemy? When you hear of the people at work who have often mocked you for being a Christian, and you learn that they're struggling, that their kids are struggling, that they're financially struggling, that they're depressed, are you willing to say to them, if you would come to Jesus, I know it sounds crazy, it might be foolishness to you, it's not my problem, I'm not here to convict you or convince you, I just want to tell you, if you would have an encounter with the living Son of God, He would radically change your life. Or when we hear of the sorrows of the world that mocks us, oppresses us as Christians, do we say in our heart, good, 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 good. I hope they die. I think for the Christian, we have the heart of God in us. We're the offspring of God, to be children of God. And we not only love those who love us. I mean, that, that's easy. But we reflect the heart of God when we love even our enemy. Are you willing to do that? Because what our story reveals about God is that he has a heart of grace for the vilest, for the furthest off person you think is incapable of receiving it. And so may we leave this place being willing to share with the world the source of life, for we know where it is found. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for an opportunity to be in your word and to be in less familiar texts around less familiar people. Father, I thank you for the heart of God that has saved us in our weakness while we were enemies. And so, Father, may we be a people that collectively say, we are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation for all who would believe. First for the Jew, and then for the Gentile, for me, for them, for all who would receive your provisions of grace as you have poured them out through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we give you thanks. Amen.